The sound of these violins is unique. And they are worth millions. Fewer than a thousand of them still exist. The violins of Antonio Stradivari or Guarneri del Gesù continue to cast their spell on all that see and hear them. Musicians, multimillionaires, art dealers, violin builders, but also fraudsters. Scientists are desperately attempting to solve their secret. They achieve record prices at auctions. Star violinist Daniel Hope knows the violin scene like no other. We join him on a discovery tour of the exciting world of rare stringed instruments. This is my dream violin, the Guarneri del Gesù, called the Ex Lipinski. Since 2011, it's been my permanent companion. I can well understand the fascination for these 300-year-old violins. For a professional violinist, there is nothing greater than being able to play a Stradivari or a Guarneri del Gesù. If only it didn't have the price tag, which has literally exploded over the last few decades. These violins have become sought-after investments, and where there is a lot of money involved, the potential for fraud can be great. Vienna, September the 19th, 2012. The beginning of proceedings of one of the most spectacular violin dealer scandals of all time involving millions. The defendant, German violin dealer Dietmar Machold. Once considered the star of the industry, he made millions with expensive violins until his fall from grace. Charged with serious fraud, embezzlement of several stringed instruments and various bankruptcy offenses, he ended up in court. Machold was sicherly one of the biggest handlers. He was an enormous bad apple, and it's, uh, it's really unfortunate. He uh, has this air of trust about him. There are musicians who, who lost a tremendous amount of money from being swindled by him. The violin business is the biggest shark tank there is. One of the problems in the violin world is that it's not an exact science. Mr. Stradivari, if he would see today how much people are ready to pay for his violin, he probably would laugh. But before we allow the darker side of the violin business to resonate more strongly, let's go back to where everything began. Here in Cremona, the myth was born that still today surrounds these priceless instruments. This northern Italian town is the mecca of violin making. Amati, Stradivari, Guarneri, the top three of the violin dynasty, all emerged from Cremona, and each maker passed on his secrets to the next generation. The spirit of Stradivari and Co. is omnipresent in the city. We see the workshops of the violin makers continuing in the tradition of the old masters on every corner. What they created between 1540 and 1744, within a period of 200 years, set new standards. Without them, the epitome of a stringed instrument, the violin, wouldn't exist as we know it. Over centuries, in different continents, with different styles of music, uh, you know, these really remarkable Cremonese violins continue to be the standard and the things that people are, you know, highly, the most sought after instruments. The Geige symbolizes very strongly 
das Ultimative, was die Menschheit kreieren konnte. In Cremona, it all began with Andrea Amati, the first violin maker to settle here and the founder of the Amati dynasty. In the middle of the 16th century, he developed the basic framework of the modern violin. Amati refines the existing stringed instruments, uses better wood, changes the shape, curvature and dimensions. It was a beautiful instrument the way Amati had designed it and it also worked very well for the musicians of the time, giving a very sweet sound, I think. And so it grew in popularity very quickly. Predecessors of the violin are the Rebec of Arabian origin and the fiddle. Both have existed since the 11th century and are still simply built minstrels instruments. As Amati begins to build violins, the era of the Renaissance comes to an end. Man is now the measure of all things, and the earth is no longer flat. The spirit of critical research takes the place of authoritative belief, and Amati creates the appropriate instrument for this atmosphere of optimism. What I think he did was he brought the Renaissance into violins. He introduced the classical geometrical design system, the ge geometry and proportion, into Cremona. Im Grunde würde ich riskieren zu behaupten, dass Amati einen fast vollkommenen Umriss geschaffen hat von, von der Schönheit. Vom Klang her gab es dann doch Weiterentwicklung. 4000 miles from Cremona. Hier we can admire the Amati's beautiful shape and its successor with even more highly developed tonal qualities. I'm in search of a very special treasure. I'm here at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City where they have over 5,000 musical instruments, including four priceless Stradivarius and even an Andrea Amati, the man who created the violin. Let's see if I can get to play on some of them. Hi, good morning. Welcome to the Metropolitan Museum. Thank you very much. So let's look at some violins. Absolutely. This is from Andrea Amati. I don't think I've ever seen a more beautiful instrument. I mean, just look at the, look at those markings on there. I mean, that's incredible. We've learned through research and through studying the decoration on the back of the instrument and the inscription on the side that this is probably associated with a marriage of Henry II and Catherine de' Medici's daughter, Elizabeth <laughs> de Valois, who married Philip II of Spain, a political yes. marriage, which then, if it's associated with that marriage, would date this instrument at about 1558. 1558. So it's one of the very early ones. Um, I feel a bit like a, a child in a candy store here. <laughs> Do you want to <laughs> try it out? I would love to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is that possible? Yes. My goodness. <laughs> Better make sure I don't drop it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. Terrific. Thank you for letting me fly it. I enjoyed standing here listening. <laughs> it's great. Let's try this one. This is the only re Strad in the world. Wow, completely different sound. <laughs> but it's a Strat. <laughs> a hundred years after Andrea Amati, another master begins his work, Antonio Stradivari. 
music had moved into the royal courts and the violin was used for the first time as a solo instrument in concerts. Ever since, the sound of a Stradivari violin has been considered ideal. Stradivari was a magnificent craftsman and it was Stradivari who was really the second genius of the violin who made just a few small alterations and really perfected the violin. And one of the fascinating things about the violin world is that really nobody has ever managed to improve on what Stradivari did despite 300 years of trying. So Stradivari produced these wonderful instruments he had access to some of the very best materials, uh, some beautiful wood, so his in instruments were aesthetically pleasing and he became famous relatively quickly and he had clients all over Europe. Stradivari lived for more than 90 years and as of 1666, together with his sons, he built more than 1,100 instruments. His contemporary was the grandson of Andrea Amati, Nicola, who was also one of the greatest violin makers in Cremona. One legend indicates that he was even his pupil. Irrespective of this, his first violins were doubtlessly influenced by Nicola Amati's style. Stradivari makes his own changes and gradually, through his own amazing imagination, um, creates the perfect violin. These are the sounds of a violin made by Giuseppe Guarneri, known as Guarneri del Gesù, meaning of Jesus. The violin maker, who lived for just 40 years, long stood in the shadow of the great Stradivarius, an unrecognized genius during his lifetime, and always in financial straits. I think he said to himself, Stradivari does that. That is the ultimate in that direction. So I would like to go off in a slightly different direction. There is a legend that Guarneri del Gesù spent some time in prison. Um, apparently, so the rumour goes, for killing a man, uh, but nobody seems to know the exact truth of the story. His instruments are very special. He had a really distinct eye and a really distinct vision and um, varied his production tremendously. His early instruments look nothing like his later instruments and his middle instruments are something different altogether. At the time of his death in 1744, no one knew Del Gesù's instruments until the passionate Italian violinist Niccolo Paganini made him famous. His favorite instrument was known as Il Canone, a violin from the workshop of Guarneri Del Gesù. He started playing concerts around Europe on this violin and everybody wanted to know what is this violin that he plays. And so the fame of Guarneri del Gesù was suddenly launched. Building a perfect replica of a Stradivarius or a Guarneri del Gesù. To this day, no one has managed to achieve this. This is because neither of the great masters left an instruction manual behind. One of the reasons for the speculation as to where the secret of their extraordinary sound lies. This is the forest which grows violins. Experts are unanimous. To build the ultimate violin, you need the ultimate wood. More than 300 years ago, Stradivari wandered through these forests. According to the legend, he selected his trees by the light of a full moon. He laid his head against the trunk, he knocked the tree with a hammer, and he just listened. Only if he liked what he heard, would Stradivari have the tree cut down? The forest warden and poet Marcello Matsuki is going to tell me what the real secret of the trees from the Bosco Swana are, right here in the heart of the Dolomites. Marcello, 
Ben arrivato. Grazie Il bosco mille. Che suona. Grazie, grazie. Tell me, why is this forest so special? Vedi, questo è un bosco magico. Io quando vengo in questo bosco provo sempre delle grandi emozioni. Mi sembra di venire in una cattedrale con le colonne le diritte, allineate, il sole che taglia la foresta e crea continui giochi di luce e di ombra. Un silenzio infinito e in questo silenzio crescono gli alberi della musica. I heard that some experts say that the mini ice age that happened here had some influence on the thickness of the wood. Is that true? Bene, non lo sappiamo questo perché l'ultima glaciazione qui è stata 15.000 anni fa. Cioè, loro hanno qualche segreto che ancora non conosciamo. E i grandi liutai riuscivano a entrare nell'anima degli alberi proprio. C'è scienza ed emozioni. Dobbiamo mettere assieme tutte queste cose per realizzare la bella musica, che è figlia di tre artisti la bella musica. Una natura artista, il liutaio artista, artista e il maestro come te. <ride> It is indeed the wood that is supposed to make these instruments so unique. The theory, in the middle of the 17th century, a period of several harsh winters prevailed in Europe. The wood grew more slowly than usual and had a microporous hard structure, which supposedly transmitted acoustic waves better. Hence, the inimitable timbre of the violins. I was last here in 2008. At that time, I was privileged to select my own tree. It's part of a fantastic project from the local community here that looks to bring artists and nature together to remember this amazing forest for what it is. In addition to Daniel Hope, other musicians have taken on the sponsorship of these trees of the musical forest. The goal, the preservation of this unique wood. Which violinist would not want to have his own tree? Who knows, maybe one day a violin maker will create a perfect sounding instrument out of these. We continue on our journey to Washington DC, where we have a date at the National Museum of Natural History. To decipher the secrets found in wood, the Danish archaeologist Bruno Forlich has developed a rather unusual method. This cello is on a very special mission. It is to be scanned and has been brought to Bruno Froelich. Normally the scientist sends mummies or bone fragments through this CT scanner. But for the past few years, he's done the same for the world's most expensive violins, 50 of them to date. He examines air volume, as well as the density and thickness of the wood. He passes the results on to violin makers who are still struggling with the superiority of the violins from Cremona. You scan the Stradivari instruments and, and then you get Stradivari out of the grave and put some life into him and you sit there and discuss his instrument with him. The results of the scan can be directly viewed on screen. So why is not it didn't make all these instruments the same. All of them are has a lot of variation in them. And you can see that in this image here, uh, where we actually display the variation in the thickness mm -hmm. of the upper board. And um, so red will be uh, thick and green will be thin and yellow will be in between. And if you take his earliest one, they're red, and then they turn slightly uh, more toward the green. Mm. 
There is a correlation between wood density and thickness. And that's the reason you cannot make a copy by measuring one because no two pieces of wood would be the same. There's quite a lot of channeling from woodworm that has gone. These are the holes that are left when the, when the boring insect attacks the wood. You can find instrument that uh, you don't see anything on the outside and maybe one hole on the inside, but in fact, they've eaten in between. They don't want to come out into the light. Hmm. We see instruments, the soundboard is completely full of these kind of holes, and it sounds fantastic. Every year, numerous scientists believe they have solved the secret of Stradivarius. Sometimes it's supposed to be because of the varnish, the special wood glue, or even mold. Bruno Fröhlich doesn't think much of these speculations. Most reports on the secret of the Stradivari instrument are developed by somebody studying one single in instrument. And they get excited and they do something special and they think they have actually solved all the problems in the world and now we can produce Stradivari instruments and we can explain the sound. And I find the uh, more I'm scanning of different instruments and the Cremona instruments, um, more do I tend to believe that there are no secrets, there are no special uh, things in the Svarevai instrument. We still refuse to believe that the violins of Cremona contain no secrets. We continue on to London. Here we've planned a special experiment. I believe Mike Guarneri del Gesù is absolutely unique. The violin maker and expert Florian Leonhardt, however, has a different idea. And so we've decided to make a little bet. Leonhard wants to replicate Daniel Hope's violin, known as the Ex Lipinski. Hardly a day goes by without Leonhard having to handle expensive string instruments. He's familiar with the restoration and reproduction of rare violins. So I leg the Geige mal up in the middle. So yeah. Also jetzt geht's um die Wurst. Wir werden also jetzt einen Abguss machen von dem Rahmen, da die Geige ja zusammengebaut ist und wir wollen auch deinen Klang nicht verändern und nicht alles auseinander bauen. Mhm. In diesem Fall müssen wir uns was einfallen lassen. Und dann mache ich eben noch Hilf Hilfskonstruktion und ich habe mir gedacht, was leichtes, das tut auch der Geige nicht weh, es ist sehr leicht, ist eben so ein Styroporstück. The outlines of the violin are cut from the polystyrene. Then numerous plaster and silicone casts will be made. This will take quite some time. Nehmen noch die die Maße jetzt gleich ab. Bitte sei sei gut zu ihr. Ich bin sehr gut zu ihr. Ich danke für dein Vertrauen und auch vor allen Dingen für deinen Auftrag. Das ist ja toll. Ja, ich freue mich sehr und mhm. äh, wir sehen uns dann in der Schule. Ich mich auch, oder? <lacht> Klasse. Alles gut. klar. Dann mach's gut. Ja. Danke dir. Bis, ja. bis dann. Bis dann. Ja. Ciao. Ciao. Now let's turn to the dark side of the violin business. The trading of fine violins has long been a big business. Since the middle of the last century, the current price of a Stradivari is 200 times what it used to be, with still no end in sight. One of the former global players in the violin dealer world was Dietmar Machold, the main culprit in one of the most spectacular violin scandals of all time. Strafsache Machold und andere, Seil 203. September the 19th, 2012. The start of proceedings in the case of the violin dealer Dietmar Machold. The charge? Dem Herr Machold wird vorgeworfen, der Tatbestand des schweren Betruges, äh, dann der Veruntreuung diverser wertvoller Streichinstrumente und letztlich äh, die Begehung diverser Konkursdelikte. 
Die Staatsanwaltschaft beziffert den Schaden mit ca. 35 bis 38 Millionen Euro. Ich denke, ein Fall wie like this ist natürlich ein Blow für die violent world. He practically fiddled himself out of the business. Dieter Machold, one of the great violin dealers. He earned millions with the expensive instruments. Then it became clear that his Stradivarius empire was built on sand. He apparently forged reports and misappropriated instruments. I mean, we were aware of it way back there, but there was nothing you could really do other than warn people of dealing with him. Dietmar Machold bought the castle of Eichbüchel on the outskirts of Vienna in 1997 and resided there with his wife Barbara, 27 years his junior. Here he held receptions for potential buyers and sellers. The sort of opulence was breathtaking. There was a cellar full of the best wines, 35 motor cars, you know, who wants, who needs 35 motor cars, you know, huge camera collection. So I was thinking, God, how can anybody in the violin business have all this? Here in Bremen, Dietmar Machold founded his international violin business. He had studied law and spent time in his father's violin workshop. The Bremen Chamber of Commerce made him an official appraiser. He wrote certificates of authenticity for insurance companies and for the court. But this Hanseatic city became too small for him. He launched his offices in New York, Vienna, Zurich, Chicago, Seoul and Tokyo and propelled a small family business to the top of a highly competitive violin market. Machol's financial problems began in 2001. The first complaints from customers started piling up. He juggled with millions, shifted money from full corporate accounts to empty private accounts. Restorer Julie Reed worked for him for 21 years. We knew that things were not going well, but we always had the hope. And uh, of course, Machol always gave us the impression that things were okay and that we were just, you know, one big deal away from having everything being, you know, all right. He was extremely charming, and I could see why people would entrust millions of dollars with him and entrust uh, their violins with him when they were trying to sell them. The banks trusted him too and awarded him loans to the tune of millions, like the Bremen Savings Bank or the Austrian National Bank. He provided collateral in the shape of precious violins which didn't necessarily have the value he promised to the banks. It's even the honest dealers. They, they decide whether it's original or not. They decide what to price it at and they sell it. And to me, it, it's always a little bit like the emperor's new clothes, where people believe it because other people believe it. But not only banks were impaired by Machold, also private collectors and performing musicians are still waiting on their money. Brazilian cellist Antonio Meneses is one of the victims. In 2005, Dietmar Machold was asked to sell his gofrilla cello, built in 1700. A buyer is found immediately. But then the problems began. Zufällig habe ich herausgefunden, wer der, der, der Käufer war. Das ist ein, ein berühmter, äh, jüngerer deutscher Cellist. Und der hat mir gesagt, oh, ich habe das schon längst bezahlt. Alles. Da ich nichts bekommen habe, habe ich angefangen, bei Herrn Marhold anzuklopfen, egal wo er war, um zu fragen, wo ist mein Geld. A portion of the sales proceeds ends up on Meneses' account. The rest doesn't arrive. Instead, a fax, in which Marhold attempts to explain his cash flow problem. Wir haben sehr oft telefoniert, er war immer sehr nett am Telefon und hat gesagt, dass er im Moment in, in, in etwas Schwierigkeiten wäre und, und äh, irgendwann hat er mir das geschickt per, per äh, Fax, wo erklärt wird, wie viele, äh, das sind Millionenbeträge hier, 20 Millionen Euro, 50 Millionen Euro, das sind so unglaubliche Summen hier, das hat er mir alles geschickt, 
Und damit ich irgendwie verstehe, in welche schlimme Lage er ist, ich habe es nie verstanden. Antonio Meneses hires a lawyer and presses charges against Dietmar Machold, but is unsuccessful. Ich habe am Schluss einen Verlust erlitten. Äh, viele, mehr als 100.000 Euro habe ich nie bekommen. The Meneses case didn't form part of the legal proceedings against Dietmar Machold, but it does show the extent of the many years of fraud. On the 9th of November 2012, Machold is sentenced to six years in prison. His former wife, Barbara, and her mother are both sentenced to one year on probation. The violin business is the biggest shark tank there is, and if I had to own an expensive violin, I would be so afraid of what I had or who to trust. Who do you trust? I don't know who to trust. How much influence does an appraiser have when he determines the value and authenticity of a violin? And how much can one really trust his expertise? London, the capital of violin experts. Traditionally, top dealers are also always top experts. An irreconcilable conflict of interests. They estimate the value of what they intend to sell. And commission can be as much as 10%, depending on the value of the violin. Da ist ja eine ganz große Verantwortung dabei. Also ich muss ganz ehrlich sagen, ganz klare Unterscheidung zwischen der kommerziellen Seite und der Expertisenseite. Das ist hundertprozentig eine chinesische Mauer dazwischen. Denn ähm, zuerst muss mein ganzer Kontrollmechanismus eingesetzt werden, um zu verhindern, dass mir irgendein Fehler passiert. Wenn man weit oben steht in der Welt als Experte, dann ist der Kopf weit draußen und auch schnell abgehakt. He's known in the business as the Flying Fiddle. The London-based expert and violin dealer Peter Bidulf. He's been in the business since 1978. Okay, that's an early very front, isn't it? Yeah, that's why I was told. Yeah. Well, I think, actually, the attribution, I think, is absolutely right. 75 to 80, I okay. would say. It sounds good. You showed it to Wolfgang, didn't you, in, in Munich? Yeah, yeah. I tried to do this uh, dendrochronology. One important factor in determining the age of a violin is dendrochronology, or tree ring dating. It provides information regarding the time the tree was cut down and where the wood originated. But the eyes and the experience of the experts are equally important. I mean, to look at a violin, really, you have to start by looking at it from the back. And then you think from the back, oh, have I seen something like that before? And the answer is, yes, I have, you know. So you, th and you think, oh, yes, it's like that other Guarneri or whatever. So the back is really where you start looking. And the outline and the proportion is really what your mind's eye is taking in. We visit the most acknowledged of all current experts, London violin dealer Charles Beer. His opinion is gospel. He's examined and compared countless precious violins, essential for the evaluation and determination of authenticity of the instruments. And people coming with certificates that were fake or that were just sort of... Um, well, I've always thought certificates were much easier to fake than violins. Yes. And, um... I remember there was an auction in um, Vienna of an instrument and it had our certificate and I, I pointed out that it wasn't the violin that we'd, our firm had done the certificate for in 1936. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there, there's room for criminal greed in practically any... Um, walk of life. In, in any walk of life. Yes. I'm back with violin maker and expert Florian Lehnhardt. He believes he can recreate my Guarneri del Gesù. I'm curious to see how far he's got with his copy. Hey, schön dich zu sehen. Alles klar? Ja, wunderbar. Danke. Alles bestens. Danke schön. Ja, ich habe das schon mal ein bisschen vorbereitet hier für dich, dass du bisschen die Sequenz siehst, wie das läuft. In the meantime, various individual components of the ex Lipinski reproduction are complete. The lining has been curved and adjusted, as are the corner blocks. 
to stabilize the rim. Hier ist schon mal eine Decke, die ist schon recht weit. Das ist die Gipsform, die gemacht worden ist. Das ist das genau die Lipinski. Wie lange Jetzt. schätzt du hat an der Jesu daran gearbeitet an so einem Instrument? Ist das nicht so lange wie wir, weil wir natürlich gucken, dass wir das alles vergleichen und richtig machen. Er hat ähm, kreiert sozusagen. Das er hat es kreiert und er hat da gar nicht lange nachgedacht. Er hat genau verfolgt, was ihn in, innerlich steuerte. Deswegen finde ich es nicht langweilig, was nachzubauen. Ja. Hört sich so an, als ob man ja nur kopiert. Aber dieser Prozess, sich in diesen, genauso wie beim Komponisten, man ja. setzt sich ja eigentlich als Geiger jetzt wieder da hinein, was wollte dieser Typ mal. Bald kommst du wieder und dann siehst du die Geige fertig. Genau, super. Ja. Also ich danke dir und bis zum nächsten Mal. Ja, super. Alles Gute. Alles klar. Only a few select dealers in the world set the tone in the violin business. If the price is right, they can get you anything. Our quest takes us on to Chicago. Dietmar Machold wasn't the only one to have an office here at 410 Michigan Avenue. One of the global players in the violin industry resides here too, Bein and Fushi. Among their clients are some of the world's most famous musicians, but also oddball collectors. I guess there was this sort of eclectic Texas oil millionaire, and he wanted a Stradivari violin the way some people want a Picasso or want a Ferrari. And my dad went down to Texas and met with the guy, and, and he you know, purchased it while he was down there. And It is in a case in his living room or library or something like that, next to his Picasso. The founders of the company, Jeffrey Fushi and Robert Bine, are both deceased. From 1976 onwards, they made a huge dent in the traditionally European violin market, at a time when the instruments increasingly became an attractive investment. These are violins that are for sale, and so, If they're all here, that's not a good thing, because that means nobody's trying them. So empty slots are good, actually. This is a 1723 uh, Stradivari violin. Uh, it's actually a, a very well-known one called the Earl Spencer. And Princess Diana was a Spencer. And so this violin has always been connected to her because she played the violin. It's not for sale right now, so we don't have an actual asking price. Um, but it's certainly, you know, it's, it's north of $7 million. dollars. None of the old violins are still in their original state today. All of them are attuned to current standards. The neck, fingerboard, bridge, strings, chin rest, and tailpiece are all replaceable. It's the body that counts. All pegs, all accessories that can be changed, you know, Uh, routinely that don't really affect the value. On the one hand, you have the dealers. On the other, the auction houses. And they're all contenders in the highly competitive violin market. We have a date at Christie's. We're here at Christie's in New York, one of the most prestigious and largest auction houses in the world. Here, everything comes under the hammer. Even the Hammer Violin, 1707, a Stradivarius, a magnificent instrument that was sold in 2006 for the then record price of 2.7 million euros. Nowadays, prices are even higher. Annually, only around 10 to 20 Strads become available on the global market. Sotheby's music expert, Kerry Keane, shows us his treasures. Very nice to meet you. Daniel, thanks for coming today. Great pleasure to be here. Thanks for showing us around. Strads and a Guarneri del Gesù are on offer. We swap? Let's swap. That's <laughs> a Guarneri for you. And That's a Guarneri for you. For me. <laughs> It's lovely. So the same maker and a few years apart. Yes, now remind me, Daniel, this is 1742. And this is 1744. Oh, yes. Right. El Jesu is always different. I'd love to try the Del Jesu as, yeah. a, as a... Absolutely. To a 
terrific also. So different though. Very round, isn't it? Yeah. It's beautifully rounded. We pay a visit to the London branch of Teresio. In 2011, the internet-based auction house sold the Lady Blunt Stradivarius for $15.9 million. It's one of the best-preserved Italian master violins, not merely an instrument, but a work of art. In an auction at Sotheby's in 1971, the lady fetched $200,000. Today, that makes it 80 times more expensive than it was back then. So one thing that made this event such a historically important event was that here's the once-in-a-generation opportunity to buy a violin like this. Everything, every other violin of this caliber, in terms of preservation, is already in a museum, already in a collection that won't be, won't come up for sale. There were six total bidders, um, past about 13 million, there were two people, and they just went up little by little by little by little, and eventually it stopped at 15.9. The previous owners of the Lady Blunt, the Nippon Foundation, they donated the entire proceeds of the sale to the Japanese tsunami victims. As beautiful as the violin may be, it's not fit for today's concert stages. It was once played by Yehudi Menuhin. It was named after Lady Anne Blunt, the granddaughter of the British poet Lord Byron. It now belongs to a Russian collector. We're now at the world's biggest museum complex, the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. Here you can find everything, even a zoo. But what interests me is, of course, the violin collection. And this particular collection has been donated to the Smithsonian by a very special donor, who, by the way, was also interested in fish. These violins were donated to the Smithsonian by multimillionaire Herbert Axelrod, now well into his 80s, a complete string quartet by Stradivarius. It was named after the benefactor. The presumed value of the Axelrod string quartet is around $50 million. He was a great figure of, like Hemingway. Herbert was an extraordinary man, and I have to say I like him enormously, but he was, he was kind of Jekyll and Hyde too. He was a major philanthropist and a major collector, and he was a client of Dima Machold. Herbert Axelrod earned his millions with a wholesale pet supplies company. Furthermore, he's a violin lover and enthusiastic fish researcher. He was well known for giving valuable instruments to young musicians and for being extraordinarily generous. His donations can be appreciated in many museums, but eventually he was perceived to be less of a benefactor and more of a very devious salesman. Axelrod and Machold became good friends and bedfellows in the violin business. You could almost say they tried to rig the international violin market because uh, Axelrod published a book saying, listing all his instruments and how much he had paid for them, and he he overstated what he had paid for each of those instruments by millions of dollars so that he could get the price of international violins higher and higher and higher. But he didn't make himself liable to prosecution in the violin business, but rather due to tax evasion. He then arrested in Berlin, and in 2005, he spent 18 months in prison in the USA. At the New Jersey newspaper, The Star Ledger, journalist Mark Muller dealt extensively with the topic of violin trading. It was here that Axelrod hit the headlines when he gave the New Jersey Symphony Orchestra a violin collection for $18 million, which was ostensibly worth more than $50 million. This was a great splash across America. $50 million of violins in the hands of one orchestra. Well, it turned out the collection was not exactly what Axelrod and Machold said it was. And the orchestra actually knew this 
before the deal went through because they had experts come in and look at the instruments. And the experts said, this is a composite. This is not a real Guadagnini. Uh, this is also a composite. This is not Del Jesu. But they did it anyway, and they continued to trumpet it as a $50 million deal and a great gift. And, and Axelrod was called the biggest benefactor in the history of New Jersey. But as soon as his wheeling and dealing became known, the scandal surrounding the symphony orchestra went public. In the meantime, the collection was sold for $20 million, which is probably what it was actually worth. I guess everybody is mad about Strads. Or a Guarneri del Gesù. All major violin stars play an Italian master violin. A must for their careers, as no other musical instrument has so much value attached to the brand name as a violin. The old violins have long since become status symbols. They suggest perfection, whether this is actually the case or not. Is the unique sound of a Stradivari or a Guarneri del Gesù only a myth? A recent study attempts to rob the old Cremonese violins of their mystique. In a test, they apparently underperformed when compared to modern violins. Scientist Claudia Fritz shocked the entire violin community. In a darkened hotel room, screened by sheets, she had 21 musicians play on three modern violins, two Stradivaris and a Guarneri del Gesù. The result of the blind test, the players felt that one of the Stradivaris sounded the worst. What's amazing to me is the worldwide controversy. It's uh, as if you told people there's no Santa Claus. Why is this topic something that has hit such a nerve that people were looking for ways to criticize the study rather than believe her findings? It's great for the world to have a romantic image of perfection to admire, but myths have uses and they have dangers. Es ist so komplex, dass man wirklich wissenschaftlich äh, das ka kaum machen kann. Man müsste im Grunde 700 äh, Instrumente vergleichen, Del Jesus und Strat zusammen äh, auf den Tisch legen und in vielleicht einer Jahr Arbeit ausmessen, vergleichen, Hörtests machen. Aber das ist auch fast unmöglich, denn wer weiß noch nach zehn Tagen, wie die Geige damals im Vergleich geklungen hat. We travel on to Hanover. A blind test is to be held here as part of the Josef Joachim violin competition. However, this one is without a scientific background. It's more about the enjoyment of sound for both spectators and jury. Two modern violins, two Stradivaris and a Guarneri del Gesù are competing against each other. to get kicked out of this blind test are two modern violins, one of which is from the workshop of violin maker Florian Leonhard. At the end of the test, the decision lies between number five and number one. Nimm mal die fünf raus. Die fünf raus? Ich liebe die eins, aber ich würde die fünf jederzeit mitnehmen. Ich spiele besser auf der fünf, also nehme ich die fünf. Wer von Ihnen ist für die eins? Wer ist für die fünf? Nee, das ist weniger. Genau das ist nee, 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 das ist weniger. Wir haben einen Gewinner und wir haben einen zweiten Platz. Der zweite Platz ist eine Stradivari Cremona 1734, geschätzter Marktwert, Herr Leonhard? 9 Millionen. 9 Millionen? Und ich bitte Sie, den Sieger vorzulesen. Ja, natürlich. Corneri del Gesù. 1744. 
At the end of the day, isn't it all a matter of taste? And what remains of the myth when today's violins are on a par with the old ones in terms of quality? A modern violin that sounds like a Stradivari? Which violin maker would not wish for that? With the help of an acoustic fingerprint and a virtual violin, scientists have been working on making such improbabilities a reality. We travel to Hamburg. We're about to participate in a special kind of experiment. Professor Robert Mores is investigating the phenomenon of good violin sound. Using a dummy head and state-of-the-art technology, he detects the acoustic fingerprint of every violin, even those of the expensive Stradivaris and Guarneri del Jesus. Das sieht gut aus. Jetzt sieht man hier sehr schön im Zeitbereich den Instrumenten. Mhm. Impuls am Steg, relativ kurz. Und dieses Spektrum beschreibt dann wirklich, dass es wie ein Fingerabdruck. Genau. Das ist das, was dieser Geige eigen ist. Also man kann sie mit einem Schlag erfassen. Man will es eigentlich nicht glauben, dass der ganze Klang eines Instruments in einem kleinen Impuls äh, festzuhalten ist. Aber tatsächlich kennen wir das aus dem Alltag ja auch. Ähm, wir kennen das, wenn wir zum Beispiel irgendwo draufschlagen, da hören wir sehr, sehr wohl Holz und Knochen. Jetzt hören wir auch das Horn, wenn ich den Nagel dazu nehme. Das heißt, da steckt sehr, sehr viel Information in diesem Impuls drin. Und tatsächlich lässt sich das dann auch, gilt es auch für die Geige. Alles, was die Geige sagen möchte während dem Spiel, lässt sich über solch einen kurzen Impuls erfassen. Now the information from the impulse is transferred to a silent or virtual violin, which then simulates the full sound of the violin. Also, hören wir uns das mal an. Okay, vielen Dank. Ich glaube, das ist ganz gut hörbar. Ich glaube, in der Form kann man wirklich mit dem Werkzeug arbeiten. Die virtuelle Violine ist ein solches Werkzeug, mit dem jetzt ein Geigenbauer Optimierungen vornehmen kann. Das kann bedeuten, dass der ein oder andere Geigenbauer versucht, exakt eine klangliche Kopie herzustellen von einer existierenden, hochwertigen, vielleicht italienischen Geige. Das muss aber nicht sein, er kann auch im eigenen Klangideal äh, nachkommen oder es vermischen. However, a complete tonal replica of a Stradivarius is possible, in theory. The fundamental prerequisite remains a good violin maker. Es ist sehr gut möglich, dass dabei auch in 30, 50 Jahren ein eigenständiges Klangideal entsteht, ich weiß es nicht. Vielleicht werden wir noch ewig den Cremonesern nachhängen, vielleicht werden wir aber auch eine neue Spitze sehen. To be better than Stradivari, let me first of all see that you are as good. Do such good violin makers still exist? We travel to New York. I'm here to meet Sam Sigmontovich, one of the most famous violin makers of our time. His instruments go for record prices and are played by some of the finest violinists in the world. Let's go and try them out. The Stradivarius of modern times. This is what they call Samuel Sigmontovich. He's been building violins since 1985. Either instruments inspired by the old Italian masters or his own creations, and with incredible success. His violins are the stuff of legends. His clients include star violinists, and he only uses the best wood for his violins. Oh, that's pretty. <laughs> and as a violin maker, he makes use of the scientific results of sound research during construction. I 
think right now is one of the best periods to be a violin maker in the last 200 years, probably. We have the talent of the, of the generation entering violin making, combined with the knowledge of the old generation and the appetite of musicians to create a really, I think, uh, kind of a little golden age of violin making in our time. Hi. Hey, you made it. <laughs> nice to see you. Please come in. Thanks. Isaac Stern was one of your clients as well. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he was a great mentor. I mean, he really was a supporter of uh, new violins. So Isaac Stern had two of my violins. And, uh, man, you know, when I got the call that he wanted to send him to meet me, and, wanted, and it's like, Isaac Stern's a name I grew up with. You yeah. know, it's like, when someone wasn't very good, you say, well, he's no Isaac Stern, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so actually, it's like meeting the Pope or something like <laughs> yes. that. I mean, it, it's, he's a monumental personality. Of course, yeah. When Isaac Stern died in 2001, his violins, including the two Del Gizu replicas built by Zygmunt Tovich for Stern, were sold by the internet auction house Teresio. One of them fetched $130,000, the highest sum ever paid until then for a violin built by a contemporary violin maker. I'm not alone at all. Mm. And uh, it's gotten to the point where people are establishing a, a reputations which mean that a musician can go out on stage and in, you know in their program you know they, they don't they don't have to be embarrassed that it doesn't say you know plays a Stradivari. Tell us a little bit about these instruments of yours here what are we looking at? Well this is a Guarneri model of mine um, this is from 2002 uh, this violin was actually uh, is belongs to Joshua Bell it's here for a little bit of uh, maintenance right now uh, no, have a go. Do you think Josh would mind? <laughs> I don't think so. I think he's busy with his strat. Okay. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah, it those. needs a bigger room. <laughs> All these, all these instruments do, but that's that's terrific. You really realize when you make make an instrument that um, this is something that has a life of its own. It's not it's not me actually. It's it, mm -hmm. and it will live longer than me. We travel to London for the last time. Violin maker Florian Leonhard has wagered to build a replica of Daniel's Guarneri del Gesù. Can the myths surrounding the old master violins remain intact? It's done. The violin maker and expert Florian Leonhardt has recreated a copy of my Guarneri del Gesù. Now let's find out whether it can match the sound of my own violin. Hello. Hey. So. Jetzt ist es soweit. Ja, hier liegt sie. Hier liegt sie. Hi. Hey, schön, dich zu sehen. Ebenfalls. Ja. So. Diese ganze Arbeit, alles ist da. Ich glaub's nicht. Guckst du dir mal an. Also, das ist wirklich verblüffend, muss ich sagen. <lacht> Das finde ich ein sehr, ja. sehr gutes Setup. Ja. Fühlt sich auch nicht an wie ein Kompromiss. Nein, es hat absolut beides nicht. Behalten. Es hat, hat beides. Alles, und genau. Ja. Ja. Erstaunlich, was, <lacht> was man da machen kann. <lacht> I have to say, Florian's coffee is pretty amazing. That anybody could recreate something that well is truly astonishing. On the other hand, I have the luxury of having one of the finest violins in the world, and the whole myth and magic of Guarneri del Gesù is still hard to beat.